It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Carolyn Downs and David Pearson. Would you like to come up and join us? And first of all, while, while you're settling down, <laughs> to, uh, uh, on behalf of the whole board, to say how really pleased we are to have this opportunity to talk with you about um, adult social care. Uh, Moira, by the way, continually reminds us that we use the language of health and social care, meaning health. Good. Yes. Uh, so uh, so uh, today is, is our physical manifestation uh, that, that that should not be the case. Uh, just to introduce you to colleagues, Carolyn is the uh, chief executive of the Local Government Association, uh, which is a, a membership association of local authorities uh, across the country. And um, David is the president of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. Um, can I just say, first of all, we're really pleased with the work that we've been able to do together. Uh, I mean, we've, we've been working together across a number of areas, and of course, including the, the Better Care Fund. Um, but um, you know, and we know from the five year forward view, uh, just how much uh, further work there is to do. So we've had your paper, um, we've had a chance to read it. Uh, we'd like an opportunity to discuss it, but before we do, we'd like to give you an opportunity just to draw our attention to some of the key points. So, welcome, and the floor okay, is yours. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we're, we're delighted to be here too. And clearly, the challenge of making sure that we integrate our services where appropriate will require leadership at all levels of our respective organisations. So, I think it's good that it starts here, in, in that sense. Um, and you're absolutely right about the good work that we've been doing. In fact, I started a multidisciplinary community mental health team 30 years ago uh, in integrating mental health work. So it has a long, rich history between health and care, but clearly we need to move it to another level. I'm just going to say three things about um, the CARE Act, uh, the workforce, and overall where social care is, and then Caroline, Caroline's going to quickly lead us into the discussion and the future. So in terms, this is a timely uh, visit to the board because next week we see the most major piece of legislation for social care in 65 years, which we flagged up in the report, but has some highly important uh, provisions which affect both health and care around advice and information, prevention and early intervention, national assessment and eligibility criteria, personal budgets as a requirement, not just a policy direction, um, safeguarding arrangements for adults and uh, in relation and the Mental Capacity Act and the work that we've done with Jane on uh, and Simon on uh, transforming care for people with learning disabilities is centre stage in, in that work. Uh, deferred payment, social care in prisons, and profound work around carers' provision for the first time as a statutory requirement. And since carers make a £119 billion contribution to the health and social care economy, £55 billion to social care, when the net state investment is £14 billion, it makes a huge uh, contribution. So, and in year two, of course, there will be provisions for extending the role of the state in terms of raising the threshold for um, people who get state support for their care from 23,250 to 118,000 and putting a cap on their care costs. Which brings me to another quick point, which is of course social care is not free at the point of delivery for everyone. And indeed, if you are in the <coughs> northeast, uh, uh, only 22% uh, of, pe of people pay for all of their own care, whereas if you're in the, the south corridor around Hampshire and down to the coast, 55% of people pay for their own care, which does impact the, the market. On money and workforce, we've, we've talked about the impact of the last four years, and I think it's important to flag up that the pay, training and skills of the one and a half, most of the one and a half million workforce in social care needs some careful attention in terms of career path, pay, training, because we have a 25% turnover in care staff uh, 30 t across the sector, 32% turnover of nursing staff in nursing homes. And we know from research done by the Resolution Foundation, published report three weeks ago, that it would take £1.4 billion to bring everybody up to the living wage. 
half a billion in home care and the rest in residential and nursing care. And local authorities, one of the things local authorities have done, apart from a wide range of creative and innovative work, is held down fees for providers such that the uh, Health and Social Care Information Centre data shows that they've actually gone down in most, uh, in most areas of provision over the last four years. So where is social care overall? It's a mixed picture in the sense that um, in terms of overall satisfaction rates, they've gone up from 90 to 91% in, in the last year. And if you look at the ASCOF indicators around performance, many of them have gone up. So how does that work in an age of austerity? Well, I think it, it doesn't belie the fact that there are some serious pressures in funding as needs are rising exponentially and resources um, are reducing. But I think our paper tries to demonstrate that actually social care has got a significant contribution to make in an integrated economy, um, not just because we're important to our partners, of which NHS is the most significant, but because people actually value the service that they receive. At worst, our joint provision is regarded as um, fragmented, episodic and impersonal when we get it wrong. And what social care does it as its best is it makes it continuous, joined up and personal. Over to Carolyn. So on, on that positive note, I'll become incredibly gloomy, if you don't mind. <laughs> cause, um, um, so I, I think we raised the point about um, going forward. And, uh, and as David said and you've said, I think we're working together incredibly constructively. Um, I, I really do. And that's nationally and locally, largely. So I think that's really positive. However, um, our ability to continue to do that is collectively going to be determined by, um, by how our financial settlements are dealt with in, in, in the future. So, um, so you um, won't think you're lucky, but relatively we think you're very lucky to have um, a protected budget. Um, our budgets, as you know, have reduced by 40% over the course of the last four years. And the current projections, if adult social care does not become a projected budget, um, it's, it's between 13 and 14 billion total across the country. So that would be potentially about a £2.6 billion further reduction if, if the budget is, is not protected. Um, that doesn't include demography and the demands on the service, which is a further four, about a further £4.3 billion. Pounds. So you're talking about a, a potential £7 billion pounds, uh, gap uh, that we would have in relation to social care. So that, um, as I say, means for us, actually, that we have absolutely no choice whatsoever but to work with whoever will work with us um, at a local level uh, to, to try to shore up uh, public services and continue uh, to give a high level of service, which is increasing in terms of its satisfaction levels, interestingly. So it's worth just that context. Um, how do we do that? And the questions are in the report that we thought were well worth a, a conversation. I just think there's some things that we need to be really, really honest about in terms of um, our relationships and how we take it forward. So in the first instance, I think we really need to think about health and wellbeing boards and their roles, their capability and their ability to become very strong commissioners in, in, in a new world. And we're very aware of the fact that there does need some strengthening and there needs, in our view, to be a much stronger link between the providers in, in the NHS and uh, health and wellbeing boards and we would really encourage people to have providers fully involved in health and wellbeing boards and we think that would strengthen them considerably. And then the second issue is local leadership and we all know both in uh, local government and indeed in uh, the NHS it, it is variable and uh, we don't necessarily come from a position where we automatically trust each other because we talk different languages and we have different drivers um, so I think, um, I think that issue of local leadership is incredibly important to us all going, going forward. And that local lo leadership, I think we really need to think... We, we've spent many, many years talking purely about commissioning. And now there's a lot of concentration on provision. At some point we really need to, need to bring together both the provision and the commissioning in a model that works. Uh, so when we talk about single commissioner, which is what we are very, very committed to. It doesn't mean there just is one person, it's one place where the commissioning is being undertaken. And when we talk about integrated provision, 
that could be one provider or it could be um, a myriad of different providers and those different models will be adopted elsewhere but uh, I was in Northumberland last week I know it's one of the vanguards which is great um, but that that integration between the council and uh, the acute trust actually in terms of community and primary care as well as acute care I, I personally think is, is really fabulous I'm not sure where the commissioning role fits in with all of that and I just think we've got some work to do still to bring it all together if we are just going to one continue to improve services and to drive out the efficiencies that we've all got to um, do Well thank you very much Karen and David I'll open up now for discussion but I'll invite Simon to uh, need for us. Well, again, thanks very much to uh, Carolyn and David, and I would entirely echo the uh, comments that both of them made about the uh, strength of the partnership working that I think is occurring now uh, nationally and in many parts of the country, although I think we also expose the fact that that is not universal, and in some places uh, we can see uh, that there is more to be done. I think the questions that uh, Carolyn and uh, David Pose on the front of their uh, paper, on the summary of the paper, are some of the key ones. And I think it's worth just, um, I just sort of mentioned three aspects perhaps. The first obviously is the overall funding question. And I think, you know, uh, I've said all along that whatever the uh, clear potential benefits of pooling funding and integrating provision, the fact is that, you know, coin the phrase, putting two leaky buckets together will not make a watertight funding solution. And when the much-heralded £8 billion pound figure uh, that uh, people have inferred from the uh, forward view has talked about, obviously one of the important uh, provisos for that was that there was not a further substantial offset in the availability of social care uh, across the country. And to the extent that is the case, and that will, of course, produce more demand in the National Health Service. We've seen some of that over the course of this winter. So I think we have a shared agenda for ensuring that health and social care is contemplated in the round as we go into the next five years uh, and the next parliament. Uh, secondly, I think uh, that said, we do still have significant opportunities to help each other raise each other's game and improve uh, aspects of the way in which our services are working. So we have seen that some of the uh, extra emergency admissions to hospital over the course of this winter have been people admitted from nursing homes, uh, care homes, who with more targeted support by the NHS in those care homes could probably have uh, avoided uh, being the disruption that goes with uh, being admitted to hospital, which is why some of the new Vanguard programmes are precisely about improving the quality and the uh, comprehensiveness of the NHS offer to care homes and people living in those care homes. And the flip side of that is that there probably are a number of people who, when discharged from hospital, then uh, spend a short period of time in uh, institutional care, and because the active rehab and intermediate support is not there, in fact, then are going to spend the next several years uh, in care homes at significant cost to themselves, their families, and indeed local authorities. And again, we could change the dynamic there. So this whole system, how all the pieces lock together, I think there's complete agreement that that is going to be an important thing that we've got to solve for um, and can produce important uh, personal and financial dividends across our current spending base and trajectory. And the third thing I would just uh, perhaps underline is your point about workforce. And I think that shows up as an issue in social care in several ways, doesn't it? It shows up as an issue in terms of the knock-on impact for the affordability of care homes from the spiralling costs of uh, agency nurse staffing, which we were talking about a bit earlier this morning. And so having a comprehensive approach to workforce across the NHS and the care sector is going to be very important, not just for the ability to recruit and retain, but for the, to, to manage the cost inflation that uh, otherwise care homes are receiving. And in terms of the availability of home care, we can see that a lot of local authorities are getting a lot uh, more sophisticated about the way in which they're procuring, moving away from zero hours contracts, 15 minutes a time, expecting people to, on uh, minimum wage, uh, have their own car and drive from home to home. Uh, but is there an opportunity for the NHS uh, in terms of the care assistance, the career ladders that we create to make it a more attractive thing to be uh, entering uh, the 
uh, home care uh, part of the workforce in uh, social care. So all of these are, I think, uh, good areas for very constructive uh, uh, joint working over the next year and beyond. And as we do that, obviously, as you said, David, we've got some big things that kick in from uh, uh, the 1st of April, uh, which we also are jointly managing, not just the Care Act, the Better Care Fund, uh, the Integrated Personal Commissioning, bringing together health and social care budgets for individuals, and some really interesting uh, local uh, and sizable uh, initiatives uh, of the sort that we have seen uh, being proposed in Manchester. Right, please, let me invite comments from um, colleagues around the table. Victor, please. Thanks. That's, um, your paper's very, clearly very welcome. I mean, in a nutshell, it says we can't cut adult social care yeah, it does. anymore. And actually, it says that any further cut, even a sustained budget, still presents major challenges to the NHS's ability to make any kinds of efficiency savings or indeed deliver the five-year forward view. I mean, let's let's cut to the chase here. Um, that's a clear and present danger, and it needs to be flagged up and stated without um, any excuses. The bit that I'm beyond that. There's questions about how how we work together. I'm struck by the. I can understand the emphasis on the NHS and local government working together. But it strikes me that the people that are going to generate the greatest cost, whether they, they, they be old, young, whatever, are those people actually that fall between the two mm. and often receive really uncoordinated services from a whole range of mm. providers, including organisations like my own, I declare an interest, I'm mm. the chief of the turning point. Mm. We, you know, operate in 250 locations, we come up against virtually every local authority that's mm. going. Mm. And I'm just intrigued as to what your thoughts are about how we build that coalition, nationally and locally actually, so that people get seamless, seamless care. And of course when we talk about the elderly and care homes, I am increasingly concerned about the, the kind of under... You know, if you go to somewhere like Leeds or Bradford or Manchester or Wakefield, the demographics of that elderly is that elderly population is changing rapidly, and I just wonder whether we've taken into account those those issues as well. And there's, a, there's a lot of there's a lot in in this paper that's worthy of further exp exploration, but I just thought I'd I'd flag those up. Do you want to respond? I can do it collectively. Respond after. Okay, let's get some further yeah, yeah. I was going to ask a question really of Carolyn and David, whether they felt that their question um, uh, E is how can we work together on the sustainability of the nursing home market across the country? Do the vanguards feel like, um, the care home vanguards feel like um, fully engaged with uh, social care um, at, at, at the moment? Um, and I, I, I do think again the um, the the importance of this is a comment rather than a question, but the importance um, David referred to doing you know joined up um, health and social care 30 years ago, and I think there are lots and lots of good examples uh, locally where things have worked. Um, and people putting enormous effort into collaboration, and then the NHS moves on to something oh. else, and they are uh, abandoned often, um, uh, their work recognised, and I'm not sure we've learnt from that work that's um, gone on in um, previous incarnations. And I think linked to that, I think one of the things that is not in their paper, but one of the things that we should emphasise is that Geography does matter, and you know it's great that we are um, being much more flexible around the five-year forward view and uh, responding to geographies, really. But actually, local government is a kind of more consistent geography than um, the, the NHS ha has been, and we should try and I think support the the, the, the geographical, the, the local authority as a, uh, a geography. And my other point is, Carolyn talked about health and well-being boards, and I do think if you look at the Devo Mank, um, we are very clearly recognising that there is, you know, there's not just a health and wellbeing board, there's, a, kind of, there's a, a, a capacity. And I think that, I don't know whether Carolyn wants to say something about the ability again to 
create that capacity locally to mm. deliver from um, uh, 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 that joint working um, that Health and Wellbeing Board gives us. It's too often kind of assumed that a meeting mm, can deliver absolutely. and meetings are just meetings. <laughs> <laughs> And you said um, it's sort of a, a, often a lack of trust because there are different drivers. I'm sort of fascinated in the subject of trust in, in systems. And to me, you know, sort of understanding how those drivers are uh, that impactful when, quite frankly, what we're trying to achieve is the outcomes um, are mm. not um, quite so, so, so different. And, and how do you therefore suppress or change the drivers uh, such that you can um, impact the higher levels of trust, leading to better uh, outcomes, which I think we all um, would 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 want. Perhaps we might pull the Kevin. Just to add one more, the I think I understand in the paper you're saying you you've tried to retain a higher proportion of local authority spending for adult social care, but nevertheless it's a 30% cut, I think is what you're saying. And that there's another level beyond that where it becomes unsustainable, if it isn't, however you judge where it is at the moment, sustainable or not. Um, that Dealing with that has obviously required a lot of innovation. Everything we're talking about is saying we need, we need more innovation, we need a, a different philosophy for the whole system as well. What are the lessons you've learned about what, you know, how did you do that? Because you know, if you go back a few decades, you'd never say that local authorities were brilliantly innovative and <laughs> flexible and dynamic and whatever, and now, of course, they clearly have to be. So mm. how did you do the shift? Mm. What are the lessons? What do you see works, what doesn't work? Um, and what are those new philosophies which we're going to have to put in place? Right, right, well, you very kindly produced a list of questions for us. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, yes, we've returned them with interest. <laughs> <laughs> We're precipitated. Yes. Um, so perhaps you might like to um, turn your attention to some of the issues that have been raised. Do you want to start, Go on, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. I'll, I'll start. I'll particularly um, start on the issue of, of, of trust and drivers, actually. Um, so, and, and, and we should all be um, seeking outcomes. And... Um, and I speak, um, I don't absolve local government from a responsibility in all of this, but um, we all do come from a starting point with specific vested interests. And uh, some of the drivers that, um, that we all have relate to our individual silos in which we work, the payment mechanisms, uh, and indeed, you know, just even that position in terms of who is the, who is the authentic leader in, in a place and I just think that is where some of the um, suspicions can come from so I actually think that the um, program the, I, I actually think the integrated personalized commissioning program is a mechanism actually mm. to truly change all of that because that actually puts the person in charge of, of the, their system rather than our systems and I think that that is a mechanism. That for me, that's probably going to be one of the most transformational things that, that we would be able to do if, and it's a big if, we are able to be successful in shifting the money um, and getting that money flow through from one part of uh, the system into a different part of the system. Um, and also, if, frankly, some of the vested interests, um, and as I say, ourselves included, are able to let go a little. And I know that... Um, Central government uh, are not keen on, well, they say they're not keen on legislation, but we get legislation every two minutes about minutiae, frankly. But um, uh, I personally have a, a, um, a clear, I mean, um, Ian has said to me once, why, why has um, social care got so many more people using personal budgets? And it's not because we're an altruistic bunch of people. To, I mean, we are now, of course, but um, it's because, actually, we were shoved into that place through, through, yeah. through legislation and, and regulation. And now it's just normal. And it's just a thing, it's something that we all think we should be doing. So I do think, in terms of behaviour change, I do think that legislation does have a place in that as well. Um, just coming into, onto the issue of geography, I, I personally think geography matters a heck of a lot. Um, and, uh, but I don't think a geography is always static, actually. And uh, the ability to create um, um, 
to create capacity. Um, there are there are many places across the country which that capacity is not there. And the only way in which we can create that capacity is by actually joining up from a local government perspective at a greater level. Um, now, the, my concern about some of that is you will, some, some parts, again, of government like to see one model and impose it everywhere. Uh, and you can't do that because different geographies and different demographies do uh, require a different solution. So I'm very clear that capacity needs scaling up. Um, but even in the scaling up, I do think there's a big issue for us in terms of workforce and capacity anyway. So if you look at the amount of change that's going to have to be undertaken, for example, in Greater Manchester, the capacity to do that from both at the NHS and indeed local government, I mean, I think that needs some serious consideration as how that's going to be brought together. So I, I, I think that's some... Uh, a, a, a very fair point. And in terms of the innovation in local government, I mean, there's nothing quite like a burning platform to make you um, change behaviours. And, and that is, frankly, what we have had. So, um, so there's no question that, again, people have done and shifted and, um, and, and, and changed the way that we operate, operate you know, using digital technologies, uh, using um, actually really th looking at some of the efficiencies that have taken out of some social care provision, you know, by looking at the mix of social worker to administrative support, technical staff, and all of those issues which are able to then actually drive money out of the system. So I, one council, Kent, which is a large area, just by doing that kind of, uh, and it's a bit like lean technology, it's a, a better kind of lean technology really, um, it's, um, that, that's driven £33 million pounds a year out of their, their social care system. So it, it, it can, it, there are radical things that we can do. I think the point that we would make is you can only do all of that once. And, and, that, and that's where we feel that we are getting to, is we've done a lot of that. And actually, you can't. Keep, of course, you can continue to be more and more efficient, but you can't take huge chunks of money out of the system more than that once. And I think that's where we are at the moment. Very, very concerned that the next lot of cuts will actually impact our ability. And it's not just if social care is protected; it's the other areas which yeah. lead to the preventative services um, across across the piece. So, as you know, pub our public health budgets have for the last two years been protected. Um, there's no, um, we don't know whether that will happen going forward. And if that doesn't go, happen going forward, plus adult social care is not protected as well, then that's going to be truly, um, I think that's going to be pretty devastating actually for both ourselves and, and indeed the consequent impact on your, yourselves as well. But I'll leave the other questions to, okay, to good. David if that's all right. Thank you, Caroline. So um, if I take... Um, Victor's comment about uh, prevention and I think the CARE Act does have a sexual responsibility for local authorities for prevention and early intervention and my view of that is that that has to be done across public sector and other organisations including the voluntary um, sector because and, I, and, I, and it is beyond public health prevention strategies are very important but it is beyond that it is actually about overall health and well-being and involves housing involves community and leisure activities because our needs for health and well-being are not compartmentalized into health and care alone so i think they need to be done at that level and and health and well-being boards are very good places to oversee that because all those parties should be at the table um, in terms of um, the demographics changing for um, care homes, it, it is. The average age is going up, the levels of comorbidity are increasing, so we, are, we, we, are, we have still have a design of care homes, which is probably 20 years ago, for a different cohort of people. So often we think about nursing homes as being full of nurses. It's not actually. They've got one or two for the whole of the population. So we are talking about essentially care staff and a couple of nurses. And I think that emphasises Simon's point about uh, workforce and the work that we need to do to join up the, the, the strategies to make sure that there is proper accredited training for social care staff and that there is genuinely a career choice and opportunity across the sector. Because after all, the, the social care workforce is as big, if not slightly bigger, than the, the NHS workforce and deals with an a considerable amount of uh, acuity. Um, in terms of 
the care home vanguards, it's early days, so we need to make it work. And I think this is the sort of bit about leadership, isn't it? About making sure that whatever we jointly sign up to, we make it work. It will always be a challenge, but it, that's, our, that's, our, that's our job, and to do that locally. And in relation to the comment about um, al aligning our performance, there was the comment about outcomes. I personally think that we ought to move towards a shared outcomes framework across public health, social care and the NHS. We have three different ones. It seems to me in the 21st century we should do it jointly. And I think there are a number of other incentives at a national level. That, so I think the role, we often talk about, well, what's the role of local? Actually, we need to define what the role of national is as well. The role of national is to make sure there is sufficient clarity about the policy, the performance and the outcomes, which actually facilitate local organisations for getting it right. If we think about the Stephen Bubb report on, on transforming care for um, people with learning disabilities, what he said was that it wasn't because people were deliberately trying not to do something, they, would, they were keen to do something, that there were barriers in their way, and aligning those national incentives is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, and finally, uh, just to, um, Carolyn's dealt with the point on, on, on innovation uh, very well, I, I suppose I would, I would add that we've got a list of things that people did in terms of creative work with carers, in terms of the technology, reducing residential care so we've taken a th there's been a 13 percent reduction over 10 years in the number of people in residential care and nursing care as the numbers have gone up so we have worked very hard through recovery and reablement to support more people at home creative use of personal budgets and i do reinforce carolyn's point about the transformative nature of personal budgets it's difficult to do it's particularly difficult to do for the health service but it is not impossible if we drive it through with determination and, of course, the other bit about the system is to make sure that we've got excellent, fantastic advice and information at the beginning so that people have genuine, genuinely understand the conditions that they've got and the circumstances that they find themselves in and can help manage those with their informal carers. Um, and and what I think our evidence in social care is if you get that bit right at the front end of the process, you can make a huge difference, not only to the number of people who subsequently come forward, but to their, the quality of their experience of services. Thank you. Thank you very much, David and Carolyn. I mean, I, I won't attempt to sum up all the, the richness of that discussion, but just on your point about personal budgets, we heard yesterday when we met uh, NHS citizens, you know, one or two, I could put quite outstanding examples of what a transformative effect it has had, on, in particular on one young man. And um, that, I think, behoves us to trust people Yes. Uh, to determine their own um, futures and the way in which they invest money rather than for us to prescribe uh, yeah. what's best for them. So I think also we take on board your um, comments about a, a, a single overall outcomes framework um, because actually we're completely interdependent for a large proportion of the population uh, in co-contributing to the outcomes that they will experience at the hands of our, of, of our two enterprises. Um, finally, I think to um, simply commit ourselves uh, to continue close working with you, and I think ever closer working because, um, frankly, the vanguards uh, don't work. I mean, if we take the care homes, I think that's a model you've spoken about where um, uh, our interests are completely intertwined, uh, but also on the uh, multi-specialty community provision and I think on the vertical integration provision. I mean, there's a, um, a real need to use our joint efforts to try to shift the focus of care closer to people uh, with full support, uh, working in the community and reducing the uh, acute impact we're having on hospitals, largely or partially through default of, of other models of, of providing care. So um, I can't say how grateful we all are to have you with us this morning. I mean, it's been, I think, a terrific learning experience for us, but also, I think, a I hope symbolic of our commitment to pursuing closer work. Can I just say one thing from Malcolm, which is I think we should commit to doing it again, but we should also recognise that children are yes, uh, indeed. also, um, mm. uh, 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 that they're not represented in the yeah. world, and um, Carolyn can obviously um, speak for local authorities, but we should think about that as, mm. as well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. well at, this, at this stage of the meeting, I want to invoke the first rule of chairmanship, which is that after two hours, everybody needs a break. <laughs> um, so may I propose um, that we break for about ten minutes?
Any dissent? No, the motion's carried. Thank you.